Well, good morning and welcome to North Point. My name is Holly. We're so glad you joined us this Sunday morning. And those of you that are golf fans, you know what this Sunday is. It is Masters Sunday. We got a fan right here. Yeah. Who's ever been to the Masters? Few of you. Wow, a lot of you. Okay. Now you know who you need to be friends with, okay? Yeah, I um I really enjoy the Masters because I'm actually from Augusta, Georgia. That's where my hometown is. And when you grow up in Augusta, there's one word synonymous with Masters Week and it's cleaning. You clean your whole house furiously so that you can leave town and a bunch of strangers will come and stay in your house and go to the tournament. That's how it works if you're a local. Uh, but I have been out to the course a couple of times and I can see why they call it a tradition like no other. It's unbelievable. And why those golfers chase that illustrious green jacket, you know, and I thought, I want one of those. And so I ordered myself one. Two days, Amazon shipping, it'll be at your door. Yeah, I know, Amazon makes dreams come true. <laughs> well, hey, if it is your first time, uh, we want you to know we have a specific agenda. Our mission is to inspire people to follow Jesus because we believe that following Jesus will make your life better and make you better at life. And so if you're new or if you're ready to take a next step, well, we would love to meet you. Um, so I'd invite you to stop by Connections right after the service today. Connections is a big room off the atrium. Can't miss it. Lots of smiling faces in there. We'd love to chat with you to connect and uh, answer any questions you may have about North Point. Well, the Masters may be a tradition like no other, but next Sunday, we're gonna host a Sunday like no other, and we're calling it Field Day. And it's not only gonna be fun, but it's gonna be a really good Sunday to invite a friend. In fact, uh, your Upstreet kids, they're walking away with these tickets today. These are not Masters badges, they're better. They're Upstreet game tickets, one for them, one for a friend. Elementary kids, they're gonna dress up in the color that corresponds with their games and then they're coming next Sunday. They're competing for prizes and they're gonna have a ton of fun. And so pick up a couple extra of these. I picked up enough to invite all of Hopewell Baseball. So you guys, next Sunday, this is the place to be. Now, transit, they've always had a tradition like no other. They just call it Double Dog Darathon. And if you've never seen what that looks like, well, take a look at this. This is my back porch last year during Double Dog, and it's where middle schoolers gather. They do some really fun, harmless dares, and then they come together on Sunday and celebrate and have a great Sunday at church. And then if you have a high schooler, well, their field day, it's gonna be on the lawn at 4.30. So again, hey, if you're watching online, this is the Sunday to be in the building, and for all of us, this is a perfect Sunday to invite a friend to come and sit with you. Well, speaking of inviting friends, I invited one today to bring us the message. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Samer Massad. Yeah. Hey, Holly. Hey. hey, North Point. How are we feeling? Great to see you. Okay, hey. he's excited. He is All excited. Right. Hey, thanks for being here. What hey, are you gonna talk to about here. today? Uh, I'm gonna be talking about joy as nice. we're continuing our series, What Our World Needs Now. So I'll tell you more later. I don't want you to leave early. Yeah. Yep, we'll Speaking of joy, have you ever tried those master's sandwiches? I've never, never been, so no. You can get it delivered to your, to your yeah. door now. Yeah, it's the, a new thing. The, which one, pimento cheese? That would be my well, favorite. Well, that's what's really they're famous for. I actually like the egg salad a bit okay, more. Okay, Yeah, it's pretty good. Right. You're, the, you're the Augusta pro, that's fine. We'll yeah, that. hey, that's they fine. have good sandwiches and that's what they're known for besides yeah. the golf. Uh, but whichever, it is. Uh, we're going to have a great Sunday for you, and we're about to get started. Yep, we're going to sing. We got some incredible humans to lead us today. We got Allison, Andy, Mike, and Tan. So, if you will, stand up and tell your neighbor what's your favorite sandwich, egg salad or pimento cheese? <laughs> Good morning, North Point. Come on, let's all worship together.
in Jesus. And I get it. We all have trust issues, right? But today, let today be your day to take a step towards that love, towards that trust in Him. Amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire time after time born of his spirit washed in his blood and what he did for me on Calvary is more than enough help me sing it I trust in God my Savior
heart. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him. That's why I trust him. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered me. I sought the Lord, and he heard.
good news. North Point, I would love it if you would pray with me today. Oh, Jesus. We're so overwhelmed with gratitude, God, that we can trust the creator of the universe with each of our lives and our problems and our joys. And God, that you've proven yourself faithful time after time. You've been that fourth man in the fire with us time after time after time. You've proven yourself faithful and true and steadfast. And that is why we have the trust that we have. It's because you have proven yourself over and over, even when you didn't have to. You've done enough for us already, but you still do it. You still come through on your promises. God, I feel like for me, you've came through on promises that I didn't even know that you made. And I appreciate that and I'm gr grateful for that. God, we love you so much. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Guys, thank you so much for singing with us. Y'all can go ahead, take a seat. So I want to start with a question that maybe you could answer about something that happened recently, maybe sometime less recently, but the question is, I want you to think about when was the last time, when was the last time you felt overwhelming joy? It might have been an engagement that happened. Uh, maybe it was a wedding day, you know, dads are like, nope, that's not it. Um, maybe... <clears throat> Maybe it was the birth of a child or the birth of a grandchild, you know? Those are way cuter than your kids, aren't they? Um, maybe, maybe something at work. Maybe it was a promotion. Maybe your favorite sports team ended a championship drought. Like, when was the last time you felt overwhelming joy? For me, it's a, it's a pretty easy one for me personally. Uh, I've got three girls, uh, fourth girl on the way, and we recently took our two oldest girls to Disney World, and um, we decided we want to take them back before baby number four um, enters into the world. But we said, this time, we're going to surprise them. So playing the whole thing, and we did not tell them we were going to Disney until we were in the van, van is packed, in the driveway, ready to head there. And rather than tell you about it, this was the moment when we told them we were going to Disney. Me and mommy to Disney. are taking you guys to Disney World! <laughs> Excuse the high-pitched dad voice. Okay, I know it's like annoying. Why do you talk like that, right? Um... They were so excited. I mean, kicking and screaming in the best possible way. You build these moments up in your head as a parent. And you're like, are they going to like it? They're going to hate it. This, I mean, I was almost crying. And this goes on for their 15, 20 seconds. I mean, they just keep screaming, are so excited. And of course they're excited. They're going to get to go to the happiest place on earth. And some of you are like, no, they're not. You know? Now, some of you are like, yeah, most expensive. Some of you... Uh, <laughs> That wasn't even the first thing came on. For some of you, it was that's the closest thing to the opposite of heaven on earth, right? Like, I'm good. I'm out. Now, look, I am not like this Disney park fanatic, okay? I, and I, I'm just, that's not, my, that's not my vibe. And there were moments for sure that had me rethinking my whole life. I mean, that's very normal. The long lines, there were a few meltdowns. There was one moment in particular, you know, there's this thing called Bippity Boppity Boutique, okay? And you can, yeah, you can... <laughs> pay to give your, you know, your daughters like a, a princess makeover. And I'm like, oh, Julie, it's my wife. I was like, we got to do this. And she's like, I don't think they're going to like it. It's a little too much. It's great, but it's too much. Like, no, no, they're going to love it. So we did it. <clears throat> it would have been more productive to light $400 on fire. <laughs> I 
mean, it did not go great, okay? <clears throat> but in spite of all the things, you know, that I'm like, I don't, I don't, that doesn't really go in the way that I wanted it to go. None of that took away from the joy of watching my girls take in the magic of Disney. Like, none of that superseded the joy that I felt watching them meet their favorite princesses and, like, gushing after meeting Ariel and talking about it the rest of the day. Me and my wife, we were certainly not at Disney for us. We were there for them, and something, something incredible happened. Their gladness quite literally became my gladness. Their happiness became my happiness. Their joy became my joy. And one of the beautiful things about Jesus is he desires joy for you and for me. He desires for you and I to live a life where we experience a consistent, constant, and steady kind of joy. Like he desires for you and for me to live with a gladness and with a cheer and with a delight, and even with a happiness, which, by the way, are all synonyms for joy throughout the scriptures. That he desires that for you and me so much that he showed us how his joy can be our joy. And the good news for your sanity and your bank accounts is you don't have to go to Disney World <laughs> to find it. We're in part two of a series called What? our world needs now. We were talking about just that. What does our world need? And we could all answer that question if we went around the room, fill in the blank, right? This is what our world needs, some kind of policy or this kind of candidate or this kind of change in our school system, right? My community needs this or this would change this. We, we, we could talk about all the things that we would say our world needs. Um, but what we're saying that our world needs more than anything else is Christians to be Christ-like that what our world needs more than anything else are maturing followers of Jesus that represent to the world and to the communities who Jesus is. And this, this, because of how good Jesus is, this really would flip our world and our communities and our cities and our schools and our workplaces and our government. This really would flip the world upside down in the best possible way. If Christians had the same mindset as Jesus, had the same priorities and posture as Jesus, as they, if they lived and loved as Jesus lived and loved. And what that looks like is the crux of this series. What, what, what Christ-likeness sounds like, acts like, and reacts like is what this series is all about. And the Apostle Paul tells us, he tells us in this list called The Fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. It's a list of virtues that the Apostle Paul writes about in a letter called Galatians. <clears throat> and even if you're new to faith, even if you um, have never cracked open a Bible, even if you, know, you don't know where your Bible app is and what folder on your iPhone, okay, if that's you, um, I guarantee you, you still heard of the fruit of the Spirit. Like your, your grandma probably had it cross-stitched somewhere hanging above the towel rack in the bathroom, okay? Like you, you've heard of this, that the fruit of the Spirit, they're, they're signs, evidence of a maturing follower of Jesus. And then when you see this list, and, and this list won't be a surprise to any of you, um, it's not going to take much convincing why the fruit of the Spirit, these lists of virtues, if all of us begin to um, live them out, why they would make the world a better place. Now, the Apostle Paul is very clear to call them fruit. They are the fruit of the Spirit, they are produced in us, not by our own efforts, not by our own trying and white knuckling, um, not even by our own spirituality. They are produced in us by the Holy Spirit of God that is alive in us. They are produced in us and through us by the Holy Spirit that lives in those whose faith is in Jesus. And here's why it's important, because if you, when you look at this list, we're going to look at it in just a second, you might be able to see some of these virtues that you know, we might be able to exhibit occasionally on our own, but none of us, myself included, can exhibit these consistently and constantly. And I'll just talk about myself for a second, okay? And I'm a professional Christian, okay? My default settings, like my out-of-the-box default settings they are not in line with the way of Jesus, okay? Um, I do not have it in my own strength to live out this Christ-likeness. I need help, and you need help. And Paul knew 
that we needed help. Paul himself needed help. That's why he writes, as it relates to the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5, verse 25, he tells us how it happens. How is it produced? Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. This is how the fruit is produced. Since the Holy Spirit is alive in you, keep up with it. Acknowledge that he is there. Pay attention to the nudges. Pay attention to the conviction. Pay attention to the promptings and follow where the Spirit leads. Submit your life and your will. Trust the Spirit. Let it influence you and let it animate you, the Apostle Paul would say. And so how do you know if you are keeping in step? Well, the Apostle Paul says fruit will be produced. And the fruit of the Spirit, he says, when you live by the Spirit, what is produced in you is the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, forbearance, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And love is at the beginning. We talked about this last week. Um, love is the primary virtue in the writings of Paul because it was the primary virtue of the way of Jesus. And what you'll find throughout the series is every other one of these virtues has its threads back to love. But today we'll continue on the list and spend some time talking about joy. Joy. <clears throat> joy literally means a deep experience of gladness. It's a, it's a good feeling deep down in the soul. And it's important. It's important to understand that joy, it is an emotion that we experience and feel. I heard John Piper once talk about it's important that we understand it's an emotion because here's what you know about emotions. You can't make yourself feel something. You can't make yourself feel joyful. You can't make yourself feel happy. You can't make yourself feel delightful. You can't make yourself feel um, delight, like, cheerful, right? Like you can't do that. You can't force it. And the same is true with joy. And you know this about joy. It's why. It's why there are moments and seasons in your life where you felt like you've experienced joy and then moments and seasons in your life where you felt like it's eluded you. Like there are moments where you just made, how do I, I want to get that back. Like how do I have that joy? What I felt then, when I felt during that, how do I have that more consistently? In fact, you might know somebody in your life and they are full of joy. And there are moments, and they, they, there's, there's an attractiveness about them. There's something compelling about the way that they live. And it's not riding these highs and these lows, necessarily, but there's just this consistent, steady joy. It's, it's like you're almost drawn to them, and you're thinking, I, I want what they have. How do we find it? How do we find that kind of consistent and constant joy? How do we find it in the mundane moments on a Monday? How do we find it at work? on a Tuesday? How do we find it at a job that you don't even necessarily want right now? How do you find it in the carpool line when you're stuck with one of the kids in the back seat is squeezing the applesauce pouch and you can't get back there because you're stuck in the carpool line? How do you find it then? How do you find it in the difficult moments in life, in the difficult seasons in life? How do you find it in the disappointments, in the frustrations, and in the unmet expectations? of life. How do you find it consistently and not allowing all the circumstances that happen to us dictate the joy that we feel? Because isn't it so true? That's just exhausting way to live. It feels like with joy, it's way more season to season and moment to moment than it is steady and constant. So how do we cultivate that kind of joy? Well, the apostle Paul, he was really smart. But he was not the first one to talk about this analogy of fruit. In fact, Jesus did it. Jesus did it long before Paul in this moment in the Gospel of John that he had with his disciples. And we're gonna about to zoom in and jump into a moment that Jesus is having in John chapter 15 and a little bit of context where we are in the timeline of the life of Jesus in this moment is Jesus has already entered into Jerusalem. He's made his triumphal entry. He's entering into the last few moments of his life before he's to be crucified for the sins of the world. And so he's got these few intimate moments documented for us in the Gospel of John, you know, 14, 15 and 16 and 17, where Jesus is kind of giving his disciples, his inner circle of disciples, final instruction before he's to go do what he came to do. And they're not fully understanding what's happening. He's trying to explain it to them. And so these important final instructions, and we're going to jump into John chapter 15, verse 5. Jesus, he looks at his disciples and he says, I am 
the vine. And you are the branches, okay? Jesus, I am the vine, I am the source of life, and you disciples, and you and me, we are the branches. We are the ones that become one with the vine. That the branch has no life on its own apart from the vine. It draws its life from the vine. It is nourished and is sustained by the vine. And what is true in the natural world, Jesus says, is also true of those that are connected to him. So he goes on, he says, so if you remain in me and I in you, if you remain in me, this word remain, if, if, you, if you grew up in church, may I have a different translation, it's the word abide. If you abide in me, if you stay connected to me, the word literally means to stay in one place. In fact, that word remain is often used um, in reference to one's home, the space in which you dwell. Any, any homebodies, you just, you love staying at home. Your friends are always annoyed because you're never going to do anything fun. You're like, I'm just going to sit on the couch with my comfy blanket and my comfy chair. I'm good. I'm at home. Jesus is saying, hey, I want you to make yourself at home with me. Remain in me. And if you remain, if you stay connected, Jesus says, here's the result. You will bear much fruit. Your life will produce the fruit of the Spirit. But he goes on, but apart from me, you can do nothing. Disconnected from the vine, the branch can't bear fruit. That the branch bears fruit when and only when it is connected to the vine. And Jesus says it's the same for his followers. Remember how Paul, he talked about walking by the Spirit. Here Jesus says, remain in me. It's the same thing, that to walk by the Spirit is to remain, to abide in Christ. And Jesus says, hey, that's when, and that is how your life will bear much fruit. What are the characteristics of remaining in, of staying connected to Jesus? What are the characteristics of abiding? This is really important. It is a submission to, a resting in, and a focusing on. It is a submission to submitting your will to God's will. That to remain in Jesus is to submit to the way of Jesus over your way. To surrender, to submission to Jesus, um, to submit to his authority over your life. Uh, to rest, you know, when you're resting on something, you're putting your full weight into it. To rest in the promises of Jesus. To rest in the person, in the character, in the work of Jesus. To focus on him. To spend time with Jesus. To spend time getting to know him. To spend time learning about his life and reading about his life in the Gospels. And spending some time creating some space for Jesus to speak to your heart. Making space for his rule in your life and on mine. Depending on his strength and trusting in his love and grace. And so Jesus says, look, as you do, as, as you remain in me, as you submit to me, as you rest in me and my promises, and as you focus on me, your life will produce fruit that resembles the character and the life of Jesus. I love Tim Keller. He talks about the fruit of the Spirit as the, um, as the transmittable, as the communicable attributes of God, meaning they're transmittable. And I love this. You catch them through close proximity. And so Jesus says, stay close to me. Abide in me. Stay connected to me. And your life will bear fruit. And Jesus goes on. And, and this bearing of the fruit, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. Like, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about looking extra spiritual. It's not impressing certain people. No, no, it is to my Father's glory that you should bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. <clears throat> that the way people will know you are my disciples, Jesus tells them as this whole thing is getting started. The way that people will identify you as someone that followed me the way that people will know that I am your Lord, that I am your rabbi, that I am your teacher, the way that people will know you're my disciples is not by the way that you pray, not by how much scripture you can memorize and how often you attend you know, the temple, how often you show up to church. It says, no, 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 no. It will be by the fruit that is produced in your life that resembles me. And then Jesus, he, he gets out of the vine and fruit analogy and he starts driving home his point. So he says, as the Father has loved me. 
So I have loved you, look at his disciples. Now remain in my love. Hey, the father has loved me and he's looking at his followers and his close friends and people that he cares about. He says, but I want you to know in the same way I have loved you. So I want you to remain in my love. I want you to trust my love. And this is, su this is super important, okay? Because this is not some kind of like religious transaction. This, this is not one of those where it's okay, submit to me, produce fruit, God gets glory, rinse and repeat. This teaching of submitting to and resting in and focusing on, it is an invitation rooted in love. That to remain in Jesus is an invitation birthed out of love. It is a lifeline to a people, myself included, reeling and trying to figure out what we can trust and where we can go. It is an invitation to experience God's best for you and for me. And just as Jesus was at home in the love of his father, he invites us to be at home in his love, to trust his love. And then he shows us what trusting his love looks like. He says this in verse 10. And if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. If you keep my commands, then you remain in my love. This is really important. <clears throat> Don't read, if you keep my commands, keep my commands so that you remain worthy of my love. Remember, remaining in is a submission to, a trusting, a resting, and a focusing on. That to remain in Jesus' love is to trust Jesus' love. And here's the point that Jesus is driving home. To trust in Jesus' love is to trust his commands are best for you. To trust in Jesus' love is to trust that his commands are what's best for you and for those around you. Then he gets to this moment that he's been building to with his disciples. He says, and I have told you all of this so that. I've told you all this about abiding in me and trusting in me and submitting to me and resting in me and focusing on me. I've told you all of this, keeping my commands. I've told you all that. I've taught all that so that. And that word so that, that phrase, it's a henna clause in the Greek. It's a purpose clause, meaning everything that came before it has built up to this moment. I've taught all this to you so that. My joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. I have told you all of this about remaining in me so that your joy might remain. I have told you all of this so that you can experience a consistent joy that is not changed by your circumstances because you are connected to the one that never changes. I have told you all of this so that my joy can be your joy. I've told you all this so that your joy may be complete, mature, and full. Not swayed by what you face or who you face, but living with a joy for life because of who Jesus is. Isn't that the joy that we want, that, that you want? A, a constant, consistent, steady joy that transcends anything that's happening on the outside of us because of what's being cultivated on the inside of us. Then Jesus concludes, here's my command. My command is this, love each other. Just as I have loved you. Here's the, the flow. Let me recap the flow of Jesus' teaching here. Remain in Jesus. Remaining in Jesus produces fruit in your life and in my life. Well, how do we remain? How do we remain in Jesus? How do we abide? We keep his commands. And when you keep his commands, what does it do? It produces joy in your life. What's his command? Love just as he loved us. 
You want to experience full and complete and consistent and steady joy. It's not about going out trying to get all the things that you want and grasp at all the things that you want. It's not about your life going exactly how you had dreamed or hoped. If you really want consistent and real and steady joy, Jesus says there's two things you got to pay attention to. Number one, remain connected to me. And number two, let that overflow into your love for other people. So Jesus says, that's how you find it. That's how you cultivate it. And what Jesus is doing, he's teaching you and me how to spell joy. Okay, I, I want to show you something. I, I, I heard this from a, a Bible teacher named R.C. Sproul. And it's a little bit cheesy, but it's memorable. Okay, Don't hate me for the cheese factor. I think you're never going to forget it. Okay, And so <clears throat> Jesus is teaching us how to spell joy. Okay, you're like, I know how to spell joy. J-O-Y. No, that's not how you spell it. Okay. Here's how you spell joy. Jesus is teaching us to spell it. Jesus, others, and you. That you focus on Jesus. You submit to, you rest in, and you focus on Jesus. And that overflows into your love for other people. And what that leads to is you and I experiencing a level of joy that we're never going to be able to find anywhere else. Here's the problem for many of us. And here's the temptation for all of us, myself included. Is we misspell joy. We are tempted to spell it Yaj. <laughs> I told you, cheesy, but you're going to remember this, okay? We spell it you, others, and Jesus. And we make joy a pursuit of our own joy. It's all about you. It's all about what I want, what I think I need, what I think is going to make me happy. And we tend with that mindset to use others as a means to an end. And then Jesus is down there somewhere. And we're like, you just got to be ready there to answer any prayers that I need so I can have life go exactly the way that I want it to go. But when we spell joy, yaj, here's what we're actually after. You're after a joy. But it's not the joy that Paul describes or the joy that Jesus describes. When we spell joy, yaj, what we're actually after is an outside in joy that is fleeting. This is us looking to our circumstances that are always changing and never promise to go the way that we want them to. This is us looking at our circumstances to find joy. Pursuing an outside in joy is you and I looking at our bank accounts for joy. Pursuing an outside in joy is you and I missing the extraordinary because we think it's just ordinary. That the outside in joy is you and I wishing away what is right in front of us because we think that what is right in front of somebody else will actually make us happy. This outside in joy is you and I chasing and grasping and striving and using and manipulating for our own gains. Can I lean in to the Christian for a moment? This outside in joy that is fleeting, this is you and I telling the world that the way of Jesus is not as good as we sing about on Sundays. And we're never going to find real joy this way. You know that. You've experienced that. But Jesus, but if you remain connected to me, if you get the order right, if you submit and abide, rest in and focus on, and let that overflow into your love for other people, he says, that's how you cultivate real joy. If you spell it right, Jesus others, and then you, and this right here, this right, it's not a formula. This is how you cultivate it. Jesus says, and if this is your pursuit, you'll be after an inside out joy that is fulfilling, an inside out joy that is mature, an inside out joy that resembles the joy of Jesus, an inside out joy that is not determined by anything on the outside of us. It's not determined by anything that happens to us or doesn't happen to us. It's not determined by what we have or what we don't have. Because it's being cultivated by what is inside of us. And when we are choosing his way, focusing on then loving others, we'll find a fulfilling joy that is consistent 
constant, steady, and Christ-like. And I wanna show you. I wanna show you. And some of you have experienced some of this. What this inside-out joy actually looks like in your life and in mine. This is so powerful. Here, here, here's, here's what it might look like. Here's what it might sound like. Here's what it might act like and react like. When we pursue this inside-out joy, here's what it does. This inside-out joy, it turns envy into contentment. That when Jesus is our primary focus that flows into loving other people, we're not looking around at everybody else wishing we had what everybody else had. That, that when this is the inside out joy we are pursuing, we're no longer bitter that God didn't do for us what he did for them. We're no longer bitter that God didn't give to us like he gave to them. No, no. When we are trusting and resting in Jesus's will for our lives more than our will and our way for our lives, suddenly we can find a joy and contentment that we can't find looking around to our left, to our right. <clears throat> That when you and I cultivate this kind of joy, you and I, rather than envying others, can actually begin to celebrate others. We can begin to love others. And the toxicity of envy, come on, you know this, the toxicity of envy, this dark side of our hearts that we all have, that, that sees other people and chooses envy over celebration, envy over love, envy versus being for. Suddenly all that vanishes and you and I are not only able to love others better, but we get to live with a contentment that is so freeing in life giving not only to us, but to everybody around us. And suddenly you and I are a lot more joyful to be around. Joy, it turns greed into generosity. An inside out joy it turns greed and generosity. Because when you get the order right, Jesus, others, and then you and me, that life suddenly isn't about you and me anymore. Come on, it's not about my time. It's not about my energy. It's not about my money or my kingdom or my own interests. Suddenly, I've got something else to build. I've got something else to give to. I've got something else to give my energy to. I've got something else and someone else to invest in. Suddenly, I've got something before me way bigger than me that requires my energy. Suddenly, we're a lot more generous with our time, with our energy, with our attention, and with our money. It's why, you know this, it's why some of the happiest people you know are the most generous people that you know. And I don't just mean financially. I mean with their life. That's what inside-out joy will do for you and for me. <clears throat> Pursuing an inside-out joy, you know what it does? It'll turn grumbling into gratitude. Christians, can I just... I'm going to step on all our toes, mine as well, okay? Christians shouldn't be the complainers. We shouldn't be the ones walking around dissatisfied in life. We shouldn't be the ones, wait, come on, angry Christians. Ever heard the term angry Christians? We shouldn't be the angry Christians. We shouldn't be the ones annoyed by this and by that and by them and by her and by him. Come on, we should be the opposite, that for us, because of who Jesus is and what he's done and what that means for us, we should live with a gratitude that quite literally lifts our souls and as a result starts to lift the souls of those around us. And it's so compelling and so refreshing. Christians, we should be some of the most happiest delightful and cheerful people on the planet. We should have the best attitudes on the planet, not because life's gonna go the way that we want it to go and not because we have everything that we want, but because we're spelling joy the right way and we've got the right focus and it is flowing into loving other people just as Jesus commanded. People should love to be around Christians. It should not be a drain or a drag. It should be life giving. We shouldn't be the grumblers. We have more than anybody reason to be grateful. And maybe my favorite one, you know what joy will do? It'll turn I have to into I get to. Some of y'all should write that one down. There is purpose everywhere you go. And in everything you do, 
When an inside out joy starts to shift, I have to, to I get to. Because there is opportunity to represent Jesus everywhere you go. That, watch this, no matter what your circumstances say, there is someone that you face every day that needs to be loved. I have to give. Joy turns that into I get to build up the kingdom of God. I have to go serve those little kids. I get to contribute to the story that God is writing. I have to go back to work. I have to go back to that drive through. No, 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 no. I get to go to work today and I'm going to run that drive through and bag those fries in the name of Jesus. <laughs> this perspective will change everything. It's not I have to. No, no. It'll change all of the I have to's into I get to. When you and I live with an inside out joy, it changes everything. And lastly, this inside out joy, it'll turn fear into faith. Even in the darkest moments of life, even in the darkest moments of pain, and grief, which we will all experience, by the way. And joy, nor Jesus, is asking you to put aside the sadness and the grief and just pretend like the difficulty is not there and just smile through it. No, 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 that's not what joy is. That we're all going to experience some dark moments of pain and difficulty. But what joy allows you and I to do is not fake it and pretend like everything is fine. But in whatever we face, even though our circumstances aren't the reason or aren't giving us any joy, there are things that are true about Jesus that we can anchor our souls to. And that can give us joy no matter what we're facing. Because we follow a savior that stared death in the face and said, I win. He went into the tomb, but then he walked out of the tomb. And for anyone whose faith is in Jesus, that means that anything on this side of heaven is not the end. It is merely a comma, not a period. And so even when my circumstances give me cause to fear, even when my circumstances give me cause to grieve, even when my circumstances are hard, I don't find joy in those as much as I do in what I know to be true about Jesus. That this is not the end. That somehow he's going to use this. And somehow, because of the hope of the resurrection that I've anchored my soul to, Jesus is going to see me through. That inside out joy turns fear into faith. So the invitation for that kind of joy is available to all of us. But we've just got to get the order right. We've got to learn how to spell it so that we can cultivate it. The invitation is to spell joy the way Jesus taught us to by submitting to, resting in, and focusing on Jesus, which spills into our love for others and you and I experiencing a joy unlike anything else. But the temptation, this is the invitation, but the temptation is to spell it yaj. And this is fleeting. And this is maybe you'll find a little bit of temporary joy, but this is not what you're looking for. And God has way more for you and for me than Yaj. Now, Jesus has promised, my joy can be your joy. And our joy can be complete. But we've got to cultivate it. It's really important. You're not going to wake up tomorrow and suddenly just feel all the joy. I don't know, I don't know you said that I'd be joyful. Well, I don't understand. You have to cultivate it. And this is true for all the fruit of the Spirit that we're going to talk about throughout the course of the series, but it's especially true of joy. That this is not like a formula that you're going to muster up and will it. This is how you cultivate joy. And you know this about cultivating something that grows. It takes time. 
Me and my oldest daughter, Harper, a couple years ago, she's right around under four, three, three years old, three and a half years old, whatever it was, and we were planting, um, I think peppers, maybe, tomatoes, peppers, doesn't matter. We were planting something. And we, we did the whole thing. We had like the spade and we, and we dug up the little soil, this little area in our backyard and we planted the seeds and then we covered it back up and she brought her little Minnie Mouse watering can and we, we watered it. And she was like, now what? I was like, we go swing. So we get on the swing set. We're swinging five minutes in. She's like, dad, are the peppers ready yet? I was like, nah, not yet, not yet. It's gonna take some more time. We keep swinging. Five more minutes, same question. Dad, can I go check on them? I was like, you can, but they're not there yet, babe. Literally, third time, five minutes later. Dad, when are they gonna grow? I was like, this, this needs a little bit more time. And she looks at me, she goes, five more minutes? I was like, yeah, something like that. You know this, that we can't make anything grow. You just set the environment, cultivate the soil. And then it grows. And this is interesting. You don't even see when it happens. You just eventually know that it grew. And so you keep cultivating. You keep watering. And eventually the fruit is produced. So our job is to cultivate the joy that Jesus promises can be ours. But we've got to get the order right. This is how you cultivate a joy that is fulfilling this is how you cultivate a joy that is consistent and constant and steady. This is how you cultivate a joy that is compelling and attractive. This is how you cultivate a joy that brings in God's best for you and for me into our lives. Don't be discouraged that it takes time. Just keep focusing on getting the order right. And as you do, that joy is a promise will be produced. And it'll be unlike anything, any feeling, any pleasure, any good that you wished you had. There's nothing that can compare to that joy that Jesus promises will be yours and mine. So let's cultivate. And let's start to get the spelling right. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus Thank you for example. Thank you for his model. And thank you that he's made a way for his joy to be ours. Thank you that you have not called us into some existence here on this earth void of joy and delight and happiness. Thank you that you have given us a way to anchor our souls and our lives to something that can produce in us constant, consistent, and Christ-like joy. I pray not only, God, would you give us the courage to do something that we've heard today, but I pray you'd give us the attention and the focus and the awareness to figure out where we're spelling joy wrong. And may you give us the courage and the focus to begin honestly assessing what it might look like in our lives to start spelling it right. We trust you to produce. Now it's our turn. To cultivate. We love you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. If you're hopeless, then let me 
what Samer shared about the journey towards joy. It's full of submission and resting and focusing on Jesus. And so, hey, we wanna equip you to do that and take that into your week. And so, uh, for those of you who get our emails, we're gonna drop you a devotional this afternoon and hopefully something you can meditate on and think about this week as you go along your life. And if you'd like to get our emails and get these devotionals, well, just visit the top three and you can sign up for those there. Well, hey, next week, we're gonna have a lot of joy. Out on that lawn and in this building, we're gonna be here for field day. We hope to see you back. Bring a friend. You guys are awesome. We love you. Have a great week.